If it's true that every young New Zealand boy wants to grow up to be an All Black, what does that say about those who go on to become All Black captains? They say when you become All Black captain, you're changed for life. In the history of New Zealand this century, there have been two things which have defined us as a nation. The experience of two world wars and the national game of rugby. We use the same words to describe both. A rugby test can be a battle. A high kick can be a bomb. A five-eighths who's playing well can be a general who's marshalling his troops. Here in Belgium, war and rugby came together. This is where the first All Black captain is buried. This is the grave of Dave Gallagher. Dave Gallagher died on the battlefields of Passchendaele during the First World War. Look closely at the names. If there ever was a piece of New Zealand transplanted, surely it's here at Popperinge. The son of Irish immigrants, Gallagher learnt his rugby on the playing fields of Katikati and made his name with the originals of 1905. He's recalled as a great leader. Um, he was a great soldier, fought in the Boer War and died in the First World War. And I like to think that he was also recalled as a great sportsman. Very soon after the 1905 team left Wellington on the ship, it was only a matter of three or four days out of Wellington, that he resigned as captain because he felt that he should have been appointed by his peers, that is, by his teammates, rather than by the New Zealand Rugby Union Council in Wellington. So they had a vote on, on board ship, and of the 31 people who voted, Gallagher got 17 votes and, and therefore was retained as captain. The confidence shown in Gallagher did not extend to the original's coach, Jimmy Duncan. He'd got the job not because of his skill as a coach, but rather because of his contacts with the administrators. I think he was quite resented by Gallagher instead, the captain and the vice-captain. When they arrived in England, the story goes that he was told quite clearly that Gallagher would be looking after the forwards, instead the backs. And he became a sort of a roving PR man, odd jobs man, and became quite resentful about it. And you do get the impression that he was a spare part and that the coaching role was not a success over there. And in fact, it wasn't tried again formally on a touring team for half a century. Despite the ineffectual coaching, Dave Gallagher did more than anyone in establishing the all-black legend. The originals were to win 31 of their 32 matches. So Dave Gallagher, who lies here in the Nine Elms Military Cemetery in Belgium, began the long tradition of success of all-black teams being strongly linked to the quality of their leadership. But out of the mists of time, what of the men who followed? The position of captain or coach of the All Blacks has often been linked to controversy, heartache and disappointment. But, like Gallagher, it's also been linked to personal growth and achievement. Two people who shared a lot of heartache and disappointment at the top level in 1998 were All Black captain Tane Randall and coach John Hart. For unlike 1905, these days the entire All Black operation revolves around the relationship that is built between captain and coach. Someone's got to get into the other hole. OK, where are you going? It seems to me that in this new professional era, an harmonious relationship between the two is essential, especially if a young new leader is to fulfil the huge legacy that goes with being All Black captain. I think the pressure's there to, um, to play well because you look around and you see all these other guys in your team. You see so-and-so from Auckland, so-and-so from Wellington, and you realise that these guys are the best in New Zealand. These guys are the All Blacks. And once you get into the team, it's just so, such a good feeling that um, you never want to stop. So you know, the motivation's always there to uh, be an All Black and be a test All Black. And plenty of motivation is required to become coach. As John Hart found, it can take years to get there. Getting the All Blacks was uh, in 95, end of 95 and into the 96 season was the biggest thrill of my life because I guess I'd given up. I think as, as, a, as a little kid, yeah, um, that's the ultimate, to be an All Black. 
It could be argued successful All Black captains are born, not made. Here at Hawke's Bay's Lindisfarne College, Tane Randall showed early on he had what it takes in both rugby and cricket. He came to Lindisfarne on a scholarship, one because of his sporting prowess and leadership potential. I had a good time at school, good time at Lindisfarne, and uh, certainly enjoyed my rugby when I got, yeah, especially first 15 level. He shone in the first 15 wearing the number six jersey, and even then showed the attributes needed to lead an all-black side. Vision, vision. Even at a young age, he, he did the right things at the right time. He had an ability to foresee what was happening before it happened and to instinctively make the correct decisions. The 1996 tour of South Africa and the 21-year-old Tane Randall was thrust into the role of captain of the midweek team. Tane Randall takes it, and the new young captain gets away down to the 22. And two years later, he was to lead the test team. I debuted as captain against England here at Carisbrook, and uh, that was pretty special too. Um, great to have a real home crowd. That's my favourite ground, and... Uh, uh, yeah, to be playing here, a lot of mates and that sort of stuff was, was marvellous. I think he's a natural leader. He, um, he's always been a leader and right from the start, you know, throughout his rugby and schooling days. Randall found himself leading a team which included many older, more experienced players. It wasn't always easy. It's always harder when you're... Uh, I guess a young guy and there's um, more experienced older guys around but I think you know, a team's more than a captain it's, um, it's everyone in and certainly there were uh, I as captain relied on a lot of help from, from other guys who, who had a lot more experience Randall's captaincy came about because of an injury to veteran skipper Sean Fitzpatrick the previous year in South Africa. Norm Hewitt is on the field. Sean Fitzpatrick has left the field. Now that is uh, a big surprise. He never goes off. You know, Sean's injury was uh, totally unexpected and I expected Sean to at least play through 98 and possibly 99. And so your captaincy was pretty well looked after. So, so uh, Tane came in uh, earlier than he, he probably wanted or we wanted at that time. Fitzy uh, was very good to myself, help, helped me out, talk to him a bit and that sort of stuff. And uh, that made it easier. But certainly with the expectations and um, how people had Fitzy and how high they had him as well regarded, certainly made um, the job that much more of a you know, mind blow. They've got to go right this time. Mertens. Oh, there it is. Captain Randall. A try on Carisbrook. There's the parents very happy indeed. And so they should be. A great start to the captaincy, but heartache and disappointment were waiting in the wings. If any All Black side was to be the exception to the rule that good leadership makes for a good team, it would be the 1924 Invincibles. They weren't well coached. In fact, they weren't coached at all. The players that went on that tour complained that they had no guidance, no one to run the training. Um, I think that the management of the team, which includes the, the captain, was, was more selected more with a view to the social side of it rather than the playing side. Despite this, the team won every match. More care was gradually given to the leadership, but even by 1935, it hadn't improved that much. Jack Manchester assumed the mantle that year. He might have been well worth his place in the team, but he was not a commanding figure in that team as a rugby player, and he was not a commanding figure in the team as a captain. Uh, and that's probably uh, one of the weaknesses of the team, really. 1949, the All Blacks to South Africa. The rugby union's habit of rewarding their committee men with overseas trips was still interfering with the quality of the coaching. The job went to Alex McDonald, a man well past his prime. I think the coach then wasn't up to it. He probably was appointed far too old, and the most controversial aspect of his appointment was that Vic Cavanagh from Dunedin should have been appointed because he was, was and still is regarded as one of the best rugby coaches New Zealand has had. Eleven of his players were in the All Black team, yet he was overlooked as coach, and it was, it was a nonsense. 
The captain of the 49ers was Fred Allen, who also found himself having to do most of the coaching. Alec was 66 years of age. He had coached back the All Blacks against the 1921 Springbok, but the coaching uh, was virtually left to me. And, uh, I mean, I, I, at that stage, I didn't know a hell of a lot about coaching. I think that was, that was an element of jobs for the boys. Alex MacDonald was on the New Zealand Rugby Union Council at the time. Um, so clearly, you know, he got the vote ahead of ahead of Cavana, who never never coached the All Blacks. He's probably the best coach who who didn't coach the All Blacks. The 1949 All Blacks were beaten 4-0 in the Test series. For Fred Allen, the burden of being captain and coach proved too much. You take defeats to heart, very much so, uh, and that to me uh, was a. a a defeat I just really felt I couldn't handle. Even though I was still playing pretty good football, uh, I said, no, I've had enough. And I decided, uh, oh, I wasn't that far out from uh, New Zealand, but uh, I made the announcement that I was uh, retiring and we had the ceremony on board. Ron Elvich had let, held the boot on the deck and I just booted the uh, boot over the side of the boat. The late 1950s and a great era of All Black Rugby was about to unfold. The success of the team was to mirror the career of the young man who was to be the next captain. Wilson Winneray led the All Blacks for seven years. I'm not sure that I was a very good captain to start with. I think like everything, you learn that too. And, but I think I became quite a good one because after a number of years had passed, there wasn't anything that could happen on the field that I hadn't been involved with before and made mistakes in some of it, I guess. But you learn from that. And so uh, I, I think you know, I became quite useful, but I didn't start that way. Well, I think he had uh, a, a wonderful charisma. Uh, I think he, um, he, he brought the best out of the guys and... Uh, um, he also was able to uh, um, lead by inspiration. I said to the players I was with, don't question what I do on the field. I don't want to hear from you. Just do it. Because I take the rap if it's wrong. The, the coach or selectors will deal with me. But if you don't do what I ask you to do, then you'll take the rap. Winneray led a team of legends. Meads, Tremaine, Don Clark. I always tried to get players to play 80 minutes out. Uh, how to start at a uh, considerable pace and build up. Um, people that could endure, people that had fight in them. I think I ended up with a lot of people around me who were outstanding at, at those sorts of qualities, had those qualities. The 1963-64 tour to Britain will always be remembered for the tribute paid to Wilson Winneray's leadership in the final match against the Barbarians at Carter Farms Park. Well, the game was well won by the time I did my thing. Otherwise, I might have done it differently. The crowd was singing and singing uh, all those lovely uh, wicketkeeper welcome in the hillside and when you come back home to Wales. And it was just a lovely, happy atmosphere. And there'll always be a welcome in the hillsides in Wales for this New Zealand side if they play rugby like this. Paul Little, magnificent W, went away. Oh, I hope he stars it himself. Yes, he has. Oh, marvellous. It was, it was just lovely, really, the, the crowd. And the team reaction was nice, too. The, the boys were very pleased. Well, he's a jolly good fellow, that thing, you know. They sang. They sang him back to that halfway line, you know. The opposition captain. And I felt so good about that. I, I, I got a tingle down my, my spine now thinking of it and seeing his face. And it made me fit up. And they've hoisted Winneray up. In the early 60s, Wilson Winneray helped set the benchmark for great captaincy. Come on, work. Fred Allen was to do the same for coaching towards the end of the decade. His success was rooted in old fashioned military discipline. I felt one of the greatest things is discipline. Now, we know it's a terribly ugly word. Uh, but to me, it's so important because it teaches self-discipline, it teaches respect, and of all the important things in coaching is actually teamwork and team spirit. He brought discipline because he was in the war, 
and he and Charlie Saxton were the most amazing combination because Charlie was a major and uh, Fred was a lieutenant. And everything was you know, personal hygiene, uh, looking the best, going to breakfast even with shoes and socks on uh, and a shirt and tie. If we had four or five moves, we'd go over them and over them and over them. Not two, three times, 10 or 11 times. And I know the players would be bleating within themselves, but there your self-discipline comes into it. And that's where they learn to discipline themselves. And then by doing that, it becomes instinctive and automatic that they don't drop the ball. And the players responded in kind. They relished the Fred Allen philosophy of open running rugby. The type of football he wanted to play was 15-man game. And he wanted backs and forwards to be a whole part of the game. And that, that was, to me, I think that was tremendous. I think a lot of it's common sense. And if you stick to the ABCs of the game, the basic fundamentals, position, position and pace, and there's no difference in that. Fred was always the boss, and uh, we were scared of him. Fred Allen's leadership was not only based on discipline. Having got the basics under control, he brought tactical innovation to the All Black machine. A great example of this was his use of All Black second 5-8, Ian McRae. Basically, it was a pretty simple tactic that uh, the ball would be fed out to me uh, from the first five and, and I'd run hard and fast straight at Mike Gibson. Made no heroin in the ten yard and open cray. Glorious tackle by Gibson. Quick ruck, the ball fed to the, the remaining backs and, uh, and it was something new. It just hadn't been used in that form before. The very first time we tried it in the first test uh, against the Lions in Dunedin, uh, I lifted myself off the ground and we were scoring in the corner, so I thought this is a pretty good idea. Taken by Jones, in front of the post, here's Nathan again. Nathan bursting clear, Nathan. Lahore, Lahore, driving and scoring. Second 5-8, Ian McRae, and McRae will be the vice-captain. The back of the scrum and captain, Brian Lahore. Fred Allen's influence was to extend even further. He quickly identified the leadership potential of the young Waira rapper farmer, Brian Hall. He's got to be a good leader, he's, he's got to be a good speaker, and he's got to lead by example. And I, and I, I, you know, and I thought, this fella, he had something to him. And when the way out came on, I decided Brian Hall was the man. Yeah, surprise, surprise, really, from my point of view. Um, I guess if you uh, were, were, had a ranking list, list of uh, how New Zealanders saw the All Black, uh, the next All Black captain, I would have been at highest fifth, I'd say, behind Colin Meads, uh, Kelvin Tremaine, um, Ken Gray, and probably Chris Laidlaw, and then then me, if I was that high. That would be the highest I could have got. So out of the blue, um, Fred told me that, uh, that I would be the captain. The best New Zealand captain I played against without question would have been Brian Lahore. Uh, not only an outstanding player, but certainly uh, a, great, uh, a great captain. The Lahore-Allen relationship was built on mutual respect. Their strengths also lay in their ability to convey to the players exactly who was in control. One of the greatest things he said to me was, whatever you do on the paddock, I will support. Uh, you know, he meant in, t in front of the team, he would totally support whatever I did on the paddock. So therefore, tactics, although we discussed them and we, we practiced them before the game, and we had alternatives, when I wanted to change the way we were playing, I kn knew I had his confidence. And, and, and for a captain, that is amazingly powerful strength, really. Beautiful run by John, but no support. And now it's New Zealand on the rampage. McLeod again, the hooker. Look at this man go. Up with him is Jazz Muller. And it's Lister there, brought down by Richards. And he'll stick away, and so is Lahore. And a try for Brian Lahore, the New Zealand captain. 1971 saw the arrival of the very strong British Lions team. 
With the retirement of Brian Lahore, the All Black captaincy fell to the 35-year-old legend Colin Meads. It did not sit easily. And the skipper number five, Colin Meads. Very rarely smiles, does Colin, on the park, but there was a little suggestion of a smile there for Wayne Cottrell. I always didn't see myself as an All Black captain. I, I felt I was one of the the troops sort of thing. As I'd played for a few years, I was often called upon to help out with the troops and to sort things out amongst the team and that sort of thing if there was problems. Uh, so but that's how I saw me role more, Keith. I didn't see myself as a captain and I always felt a little bit inhibited being an all-black captain. And there, number seven, Ian Kirkpatrick. 1972, again, a reluctant captain. Ian Kirkpatrick was given the job when Colin Meads retired. My responsibility to it was then that if they wanted you to be captain, you, I took it on because they wanted you to do it, and you did it for the team, and, and because they wanted you to do it. And I mean, that was, that was the main reason that I, that I took it on. Ralston has gone with Peter Whiting, but there's the favourite throw over the top to Going. Said Going is almost, almost to the post. In goes the New Zealand forward drive. That was laid back beautifully. Kirkpatrick has scored. He was a great player, and uh, he, he was a good leader as well. Um, probably in, with Kirk, he didn't um, get the support of us as players as much as uh, perhaps he could have uh, when he was leading the team. And... Uh, that was in 72, 73, and, and the tour didn't go as well as it should have. And perhaps it was us, the players, that didn't support Kirk as well as we could have. The 72-73 tour to Britain was not a happy one. The Keith Murdoch affair and the surly image of the team meant there were not good memories. On their return to New Zealand, the team faced an internal tour and a one-off test against England. Inside New Zealand's 25. The internal tour was seen as a disaster two or four matches were lost. Then, against England in the one-off test, they lost again. That's a point try to Smack Stephen. It was to be the end of Ian Kirkpatrick as captain. In 1974, he was replaced as skipper for a tour to Australia. We had such a disastrous year the year before. And I and said, um, well, you, you have who you like because yours is ahead on the block and it's going to be on the block and it's going to be chopped off pretty soon too, quite obviously. So uh, that, that's how the team was selected. You took 15 new caps out yeah. of 25. Yeah. That was radical, to say the least. Yes, it was, I guess, but we were at rock bottom, weren't we? The changes worked. On that tour to Australia, the All Blacks won 12 of 13 matches. They beat Australia in two tests and drew one. The JJ Stewart philosophy of coaching obviously produced the required results. I've always felt that coaching at, uh, at any level is not a matter of, of motivation. I, I, I'm not a great believer in that because, I, quite frankly, I, I don't like, I can't swallow my own bullshit. And, um, and I won't, <laughs> don't like submitting players to of this highest power yelling and screaming stuff. Had a great philosophy on the game, tried to play a very open uh, running game. And again, he involved uh, all the players and, and tried to work out strategies and how the game should be played. He was just miles ahead of his time. And, you know, he'd be, um, you know he was an absolutely superb coach. Coach in the sense where uh, he would bring the best out of people. He wouldn't, tend to, you know, he wouldn't put his style on, on players. He would bring out the best in players so they could develop themselves. Now, uh, several of the New Zealand players are being called out. Andy Leslie, the captain, Ian Kirkpatrick as well. Andy Leslie was not only a first-time All Black, he was now captain. The first I knew about it was, uh, you know, when the teams were named under that grandstand at Athletic Park afterwards. And even then, you know, I'd become so uh, used to hearing the name A.R. Sutherland read out that when A.R. Leslie come out, I didn't hear it. Nick to Stevens actually whacked me on the back and said, it was you, you bugger. <laughs> he said, it wasn't Sully this time, it was you. So, you know, it was a, a huge surprise. He'd played 110 first-class games for Wellington. And he must have thought the parade had passed him by, you know. And there he was, not only an all-black, but uh, captain. Blind side to 
Cole and Cole's kick rebound. Could be a try. Great chance. Robertson can't take it. Or who's there? It's on the line. Leslie scored. To cope with his new status, Leslie called on his many years of provincial experience. You've got to be uh, accessible. Um, at the same time, I, I still think, and you've, you, you can't be you can't be the party boy. You can't be the good time Charlie. You've got to, you've got to know when to step back.